for those who are alive and remain. Please turn to number uh, Joel chapter 3. The book of Joel. We will wrap up our study in Joel. October, November, December. It only took us three months. But there was a bit of a hiatus I went in our study of Joel. So I, but I do want to close up Joel. Joel chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 1. We're going to read just 14 verses. I trust you're all there. <coughs> Excuse me. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense unto your own head? Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither you have sold them, and I will return your recompense unto your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians and to people afar off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put you in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Lord God, I ask for your help this morning. I pray for the anointing on the preaching of your word. I ask God that our ears would be open, our hearts would be in tune, that we would hear from you. Lord, I pray that you will grant us understanding, and God, that you will be glorified. Let your will be done, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Valley of Decision. I said last week, the book of Joel covers nearly 4,000 years of history. Remember Joel? Uh, he spoke of a warning. He warned the people of Israel of his day, the people of Judah, of his day uh, to repent of their rebellion and to turn to God or judgment was coming. The people refused to repent and judgment came. Remember he sent the army of locusts, canker worms, palmer worms, they destroyed the crops, brought forth famine and, um, and uh, pestilence, and um, then they repented. The people cried out to God in repentance, and the Lord brought restoration. Remember, I will restore that, that the locust has eaten, the palmer worm, canker worm, and I give, I'll give you the former rain and the latter rain, so that he would restore the crops. He, rest, he brought restoration to uh, Judah in Joel's day. Remember I said last week, or two weeks ago, or last time we spoke, a few times ago. He spoke in future, his future, our past, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, some 2,000 years ago. They were gathered in one place, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and the promise was that he would pour his Spirit out upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, young men will have dreams, old men visions, so forth. 
Uh, and then he speaks now, we're going to look at the future, future to us. The battle of Armageddon. Uh, and then the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, today we'll look at the future events. We looked last time at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And now Joel draws our attention to the future. Uh, for behold, in those days and in that time. So we're looking at a future time. Uh, everybody with me? Amen. Like never before, I need you to pay special attention. I was looking over this, these notes, and I'm trying to think of a way. There's, this, is, um, this is deep. This is deep thought. Uh, read along with me on this. This next paragraph will set the stage. It will give us an understanding when we talk about uh, prophecy. I think uh, Brother Ladd puts it in a very succinct way, but, but it's deep. It's heavy uh, in, in thought. So... George Eldon Ladd, in his book, The Gospel of the Kingdom, he said, usually the prophets, as they looked into the future, spoke of coming events without attempting to give the temporal sequence of the several stages of the accomplishment of God's purpose. Not only is the distant future viewed as a single, although complex event, but the immediate future and the distant future are described as though they constituted a single act of God. This is why the day of the Lord and the prophets is both an historical visitation of God and an eschatological act. Eschatological means end times. Uh, in other words, this is also referred to as the law of double reference. So um, let me just set the foundation. We're going to get to easier stuff in a minute. But oftentimes, most oftentimes, when God instructed a prophet to speak, he spoke, not differentiating the near future from the distant future. He just spoke in terms. Why? Because God lives in the constant now, in the ever-present now. Uh, and so when Joel wrote, he spoke of things to come as if it was just one event. Uh, this is the law of double reference. There was an immediate um, uh, fulfillment of the prophecy as well as something that would happen in the future. Are you with me? You get, you get that? Um, if I confuse you, come see me after church. I just want to set the stage here. Okay. God lives outside of time. Just think about this. Uh, a billion Years from now, God is already there. God is sitting and waiting for us in a trillion, billion, quadrillion years from now. God is already there. He has always been there. And a billion, trillion, quadrillion, gazillion years before, he's still there. And always has been. You hurt yet? Your head hurt? We can't, we can't grasp these things. God is, he exists outside of time. He exists in the present now, in the constant present. So when he sees things, he sees things as one big story. We break things down into time frames. Remember what Peter said? He said, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. He's not saying that a thousand years is a day or a day is a thousand years. He's saying time is irrelevant to God. He gave us, he gave us time to measure days and years and lives and but God, time is irrelevant to him. And so um, he exists in the constant present. We see the same phenomenon that we see here in Joel. We see it in the New Testament. In the three accounts of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Remember, um, just let me read this. Um, uh, uh, Matthew 24, verse 2. And Jesus said unto them, his disciples... See ye not that all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be uh, left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat uh, upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? 
And Jesus gives an answer. And we have been left to sort it all out and say, well, this is before the tribulation. This is in the tribulation. This is after the tribulation. And all the debates ensue over this. When Jesus gives the answer, he's answering all of that. This, th this is what's going to happen. And he tells the whole story from that point to the, to the, to the distant future. Are you with me? He doesn't break it down and say, okay, now this is going to happen prior to the rapture, then this is going to happen during the tribulation, and then this is going to happen in the millennial reign. He just simply states the future, and we, it, he sees it as one, one act, and uh, we, we break it down. Jesus is speaking uh, when he says that not one stone will be left upon another. People say, well, that was uh, uh, the Romans, uh, 66 A.D. to 70 A.D. Titus destroyed Jerusalem, knocked out, not one stone was left upon another. That is historical. Yes, it is. And he was speaking of that near fulfillment of the Romans, but he was also speaking of a distant time of destruction under the Antichrist. You with me? Amen. He just, he doesn't break it down. He simply states it. As the story. Joel speaks of a coming future judgment. He said it would pr be preceded by signs. Now here again, the debate. Uh, he, he tells us that there will be signs in the heavens. There will be, uh, uh, this is going back to Joel chapter 2. And I will show you wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Keep that in mind. So he, there, uh, he, he's saying that there will be signs in the heavens. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun and the moon there will be signs in the heavens. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And so the debates. Uh, the, what does this mean? We've seen the blood moons and and we talk about the, is the blood moon one of the signs of his coming? Uh, the pillar, is this a solar eclipse when, when the sun doesn't shine and the moon? Uh, is this, a, or is it some supernatural phenomenon that we've never seen before? Uh, my answer, don't know. We don't know. Uh, but there have been several judgments against Jerusalem in history. Jerusalem has been overrun many, many times. Even since Joel's prophecy, uh, it has been overrun. But Joel here is speaking of a worldwide judgment, something that has not yet taken place. A worldwide judgment because he talks about the nations being judged and being called to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Are you with me? Amen. Did I, am I clear? Did I set up a foundation? Joel's talking about things to come in the future. All right? Okay. He says in verse 1 of chapter 3, Behold, in those days and at, in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, God has made a promise to Israel. When we, when we think of Israel... We think of Israel proper, Israel as a whole. Israel meaning the Jews, God's chosen people. And God made a promise to Israel. Uh, he made a promise um, to Abraham. And he continued it with Isaac and his son Jacob. And the promise remains. Now, when Joel is speaking, he's speaking to Judah, the southern kingdom. If you remember, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel were divided because of rebellion. Judah remained true. Judah remained with the kings of, uh, of Israel, the kings of God's people. They the, the capital being Jerusalem, it remained the southern kingdom. The rebellious went up north and created Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, and Joel is writing to Judah writing to Jerusalem, this is, the, uh, this is the promise of things to come for God's people in Israel, in Judah, in Jerusalem. Okay? You with me? 
I hope I didn't confuse you there. This is the, God's promise to his people through Joel writing to Judah. And the promise that God had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was that the land of Canaan, and he defines the borders, was to be theirs forever. Amen. He promised them the land. Abraham, wherever your soul, the soul of your foot touches, that's yours. And it's yours forever. He, re, he re, uh, renewed the promise to Isaac, renewed the promise to Jacob, and he has never reneged on his promise of that land. Now Joel, speaking of things to come, he's writing to Judah, he doesn't address the church age directly. Some people think he does. He doesn't address the church age. He doesn't break it down. The prophets alluded to the church age, in Old Testament prophecy, we can go through a whole list. Isaiah speaks about the church a lot in the Old Testament, but he doesn't. He, does, he speaks of the Gentiles and all nations. Joel doesn't address the church age directly. The prophets allude to it, but there are many New Testament passages that help us interpret the prophecies concerning the church. Uh, we see the church very clearly in the New Testament. The New Testament uh, looks back at the Old Testament, and the things that were concealed in the Old Testament are revealed in the New Testament. And uh, Jesus speaks very often of the, uh, relates the Old Testament to the New, um, and many passages in the Old Testament, uh, uh, many passages in the New Testament clarify the passages in the Old Testament. Did I confuse you? Almost confused myself. Okay. Uh, but the church is not an afterthought or a stopgap between Israel's rebellion and their restoration. Joel talks about the things to come in the future. Uh, we know that there is a church age in between. And uh, what, what we have to understand, um, God didn't say, well, I came to the, to the Jews. I, I came to my own people and they rejected me. Therefore... I turn to the Gentiles, and now it's the Gentiles' turn. But after the age of grace, after the church age, when Israel finally repents and comes back to me, I'm going to pick up the story with them. That is, that's partially true, but you've got to understand this. God didn't create the church because Israel didn't uh, love him, and, uh, but when they turn around, he's going to now go back to loving. Uh, they have to leave because they're going someplace, not because they hate me. It's not a stopgap to fill in the gap between their rebellion and the restoration. It's not an afterthought of God. Well, the Jews don't love me, so I guess I'll turn to the Gentiles. No, it is, it is one story, one eternal plan that God has, and the church is part of God's eternal plan. So when Joel writes about the future, he doesn't break it down into dispensations or periods of time. He simply tells the story of what's going to happen in the future. And the church is part of that eternal plan. The Gentiles are part of the same story. And Joel is telling the whole story. Are you with me? Okay. He, saw, he talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord. So what exactly is the great and terrible day of the Lord? There are many references, many, many, many references regarding the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 2, 12, I'll give you a few references. Isaiah 13, 6, 34, 8, Lamentations 2, 22, Ezekiel 13, 5, on and on and on. The day of the Lord you'll find. You'll find the day of God's vengeance. You'll see the day of the Lord's anger, the day of wrath, the day of judgment, the day of Christ. Many references, many different ways to talk about this great and terrible day of the Lord. The Jews knew very well what the great and terrible day of the Lord was because all the prophets spoke of it. This great and terrible day. So what is it? What is the great and terrible day of the Lord. Well, Joel tells us here that God will gather all the nations, people, before him to be judged at the time of his coming. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. God will judge, will gather all the nations, all the people 
<clears throat> before him to be judged at the time of his coming. Uh, let's fill in the time here. First of all, not every single human being on the planet is going to be called together. When he says he'll call the nations, we're going to see what he means by that in a moment. When he, he's going to call the nations, he's going to call the people to, to come to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Battle of Armageddon, to be judged there. Um, he, uh, this happens just prior to his earthly reign for a thousand years when Christ comes and establishes his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. And it happens after the seven years of tribulation. Joel doesn't mention these things. He's simply telling the story that, that well, there will come a day, a great and terrible day of the Lord, when God will gather the nations together. So now we have to fill in the gaps between the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and then on that great and terrible day of the Lord. We have to fill in the gaps. You with me? So let's fill in the gaps. Joel doesn't mention, Joel doesn't go into detail, but Paul, the apostle, addressed this in his writing to the Thessalonians. Uh, remember Paul established a church in Thessalonica. He, he, he is tempted, he started to establish a church. On his missionary journeys, he's, he started a church, but what do we know that happened to Paul at Thessalonica? There was an uprising against him, and he was forced out. He ran for his life. He escaped by the skin of his teeth from Thessalonica. So he had started a church, but like many places, uh, he didn't get a chance to fully establish the church. He would establish a church, call elders, set pastors in place, and then he would move on to the next. But he didn't get a chance to do all that in Thessalonica. He began, he introduced them to Christ and he started to establish the church, but he had to get out of Dodge. And so this fledgling church doesn't have a strong foundation. And some things arose, some questions arose, and Paul had to write to them to answer those questions. And so he wrote one letter, and then he wrote a second letter to clarify some of the questions that they had. And, um, and here's where uh, we start with his second letter. You with me? Amen. Let me know if I bore you. If I bore you. Anybody bored? Everybody honest? All right. So he's writing. We're filling in the gap. Joel, that Joel doesn't tell us about. We've got to get to that, but we've got to fill in the gaps. Paul writes, and he, and he addresses the Thessalonians, and we're going to look at the second letter first. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-5. through 5. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him. What is that? The rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So some people were writing and speaking, saying Paul and the other disciples were teaching that the day of the Lord, that day of judgment, was approaching. And so Paul says, no, wait a minute. I'm addressing, I'm calling upon you to remember uh, the, 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 the coming of the Lord and the gathering our, of ourselves together. And he says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The great and terrible day of the Lord, the, the day of judgment, uh, uh, will not come, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he has got, uh, see, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who letteth, or actually hinders, will hinder 
until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Paul writing to the Thessalonians because they were afraid that the day of God's judgment, this day of wrath, the day of the, uh, the Lord was upon them. And Paul writes and says, no, first of all, understand this. I'm writing to you and I'm coming to you to remind you of this. I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, our gathering together unto him. That day is not going to come until there first be, King James and many of the translations say, a falling away. Uh, that word falling away, the two words in, in the English, falling away, is translated from the Greek word apostasia. You have your thinking caps on? Everybody look at me, wave. Please. The word is apostasia, which is translated later, uh, translated into English as a falling away. The word apostasia, the word simply means departure. Not from or to, it simply means departure. And Paul speaks, and he, in the Greek, there is a definite article, the departure. Okay? So, let's look at what Paul says. He's writing, he says, the day of the Lord is not going to come until there first come the departure. The departure, with the definite article, Clearly, one that was known or expected. You're with me still? The day of the Lord's not going to come until the first be the departure. Kenneth Wiest, in his uh, expanded translation, and he's not the only one. There are many, many, many. Here, just listen. I, but I put him there so you'll know I'm not a heretic. Uh, assuming that Kenneth Wiest is not a, also a heretic. But Kenneth Wiest puts it in his expanded translation this way. Do not begin to allow anyone to lead you astray in any way, because that day shall not come except the aforementioned departure, bracketed, of the church to heaven come first. Now you say, well, the departure of the church to heaven, that's not what the Bible says. It says a falling away. Understand that before the 1600s, before the King James and, and the modern translations, in, up to the, uh, including the Latin Vulgate, it was the predominant understanding within the church that there was the departure and that the departure represented the church being taken out. The, the church departing into heaven. It was understood by the early church by, for, for 16, uh, up until the 1600s. Now, when the Bible was translated in the 1600s from the Latin Vulgate into the English language, that word apostasia, that translated into the word apostasy, that word apostasy meant at that time a departure from truth or from the faith or from something to something else. You with me? And so when they translate it, they took the word ap apostasia, translated it into apostasy, and apostasy at that day and time meant a departure from the faith. And so the writers put departure, a falling away, or departure from the faith. But that wasn't the original intention of Paul when he wrote to the Thessalonians. Now you say, well, it doesn't matter. All in all, it doesn't, because he talks to Timothy, and he talks about our departure from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So if you interpret it that way, you're fine, no, no harm. But that's not the context of what Paul is writing about. Are you still with me? He's talking about the gathering together and, uh, and, and uh, the, the coming of the Lord and being caught up. And, uh, and so... 
this is clearly referring to the departure of the church. Now, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians, and we'll look at what he said initially when he wrote to them. Remember, he tried to establish the church, but he got run out. There's questions. They're afraid. Well, you talked about the Lord coming and people being taken out of the earth. Well, what if we die before, you know, did he already come? What if we die before he comes? Is that, and so Paul says, let me, let me clarify what I, what I would have done had I been there. But let me straighten you out. And so he writes this letter. And in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, um, he's starting at verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede, literally, them which are asleep. Here's the sequence of events. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So Paul says, here's what's going to happen. The Lord's going to come down. He's gonna sh there's going to be a shout. The church is going to, uh, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. The, the church who's alive is going to be caught up. We're going up to be with the Lord forever. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about those who died or haven't died yet. We're all going to be together when the Lord calls us home. And then the church is concerned about, well, the, the people are saying that the day of the Lord is at hand. Paul says, no, no, no. That day, the great and terrible day of the Lord is not going to come until first there is the rapture. The, the departure, you remember the one I told you about. Then, when the church is gone, that which is keeping uh, the forces of darkness held at bay, when the church is gone, then the Antichrist will be revealed for who he is. Still with me? Amen. All right. There will be a departure, the one I told you about, in essence. The context, his coming and our gathering together unto him, he's talking about the rapture. And then the man of sin is then revealed for who he is, the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? You got no clue. We play around with it. I have my suspicions, but every time I think I got one, he dies. Or <laughs> something else. We, we don't know. We, it is not, we are not privy to the information. And we won't know because we'll be caught up. Then he's revealed. He's, I think he's walking now. I think he might have some things to do with the things of the world. Um, yeah, but we don't know. He won't be revealed until the church is taken out. And then all hell breaks loose. The mystery. He, Paul says, when writing to the Thessalonians in the second letter, he says uh, in verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. The he, I believe, is the church, not the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will be here even, he always has been and always will be. But he will be taken out of the way. That is the church. Uh, so the mystery of iniquity. Uh, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, Paul said. What is the mystery of iniquity? Do you not sense an undercurrent, an evil undercurrent in everything in the world? Do you not sense there's something evil uh, uh, underneath everything? Do you not see it? Uh, the, uh, we see it in, in politics. You know, um, I, have an, I have a political opinion and I vote. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but our votes really don't matter. Let me just tell you. There, there is an undercurrent. You call it Illuminati, you call it whatever you want to call it, but there is an evil undercurrent. There is a conspiracy. I am a conspiracy theorist because there is a conspiracy. 
because they're, the powers that be are orchestrating. I believe people, armies, nations are like pawn pieces on the, on the chessboard just being moved around all beyond our, we have no clue. So we, we see all these political things happening in the world and we jump up and respond and we shout and we get angry. And we, Friends, it's all, it's all part of the plan. There are forces at work. The prince of the powers of the air, the ruler of darkness, is at work. The, and Paul told us the, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's why, that's why you, you can't put your finger on it. You can't put your finger on it, but you see something's not right. It happens everywhere. It has been happening, and it will continue to happen. And the only, the only saving grace to the world thus far, I believe, is that the church is still here preaching the gospel, saying, well, somebody listen to me. And God is holding back this. But Paul says when the church is gone, then, th then that which has stopped this wickedness from overrunning the world will, will be gone and... Uh, and all hell will break loose. Then the Antichrist will be revealed for who he is. And the world will go into a seven year tribulation period. You still there? And then he, Paul says, and God will then send a strong delusion upon those who did not receive the love of the truth. God will send a strong delusion that they be damned. Listen, who is this? Who are these people? What is going to happen? What, what does it mean that God will send a strong delusion? They, these are those who, who hear now, hear the word of God, who are being told the word of God by preachers and neighbors and friends, and they're seeing it on the TV, and they're reading it in the news, and it's all over the radio, and, and everywhere you go, somebody's talking about Jesus and trying to bring them to the truth, and, uh, and, but they won't accept it. They reject it. These are those who have heard the truth, but did not receive the love of the truth. They've rejected the truth. They have not received the truth. And now the church is gone, and God, through Paul, says, and he will send a strong delusion that they will believe a lie. Now listen, friends, we do, we, we do a great disservice. In, in fact, we harm people when we said, I've even preached this myself, so I'm guilty as the rest uh, that I've heard. But we are wrong, and we do a, a great harm to people. We give a false hope to people when we say this. Listen, have you said, don't, don't raise your hand, but you have, I'm sure. You told your friends, you told your neighbor, your loved ones. Listen, I know you won't listen to me now, but when the church is gone, when you call me up and I'm not here, and all my friends are gone, and you go to the church and it's half full. Wait a minute, wait a minute no. Did I say that? <laughs> when you go and, 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 the, and all the people you know are Christian, they're all gone. Oh, the rapture took place. Brother, friend, my, you better get on your knees and repent and call out to God then and be saved because judgment is coming. You might have to give your life, but you better get right with God then. Have you said that? You've heard that. You've heard it preached. Wrong. Totally wrong. And we've, great, we've done great damage because that's not what the Bible says. There is no such clause in God's word that says when the church is gone, now call people to repentance. In fact, Paul says, when the church is gone, God is going to send a strong delusion to those who did not receive the love of his truth. Those who heard God's word, but rejected it. Those who heard about the love of Christ and his sacrifice for their lives and, sin, and their sin. Who, they heard it, but they did, not re, they did not receive the love of the word. God says, when the church is gone... He'll send strong delusion so they'll believe a lie. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, they will believe the Antichrist. And they'll believe, who knows what they'll believe, uh, UFOs that came and took us or Russians came out with some bug, that, whatever. They're going to believe a lie. They're not going to believe the truth so that they will be damned. You say, well, that's so cruel. Listen, friends. The day, the day of the Lord... Uh, 
begins, uh, well, the, the tribulation, let me go back. That tribulation period or that seven year time of tribulation upon the earth begins with a peace treaty or a peace pact or some understanding of peace with Jerusalem, with Israel and with the, with the world, with the Arabs, with the Palestinians, or um, there's going to be a signing or an agreement of some kind where, the, where, the, uh, where there is a seven-year peace pact. If you hear anything in the news about Israel signing or agreeing to anything for seven years of peace, assume the position. Get ready. Get ready. So this tribulation period will begin. And then, immediately after that tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. What does that sound like? That's Joel's prophecy. The great and terrible day of the Lord, the sun and the moon and the stars and the sign of, of the Lord's coming and, um, and the tribes mourning God's judgment upon the nations as he gathers them together into the valley of Jehoshaphat. God will gather together for judgment from all the nations those who stood against him. Now listen, remember Jesus talks about separating the goat nations from the sheep nations. He's not talking about countries per se. What if there's a country, what if Russia, who rejects God, but there's, uh, uh, but there's Christians in Russia, do they pay the penalty? Well, to some degree, we all we do suffer the consequences of our quote-unquote leaders, but he's talking about gathering together from all the nations, people, people, those who have not stood with Israel, those who have rejected Christ and who objected the Messiah and rejected God's people and rejected the church, those are the ones all that will be gathered together. In fact, as you can see in the scriptures, not only will God gather them, but they come on their own. It's under God's plan, but they come on their own. Listen, still with me? The valley of Jehoshaphat. God says through Joel, I will gather them together in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Literally, Jehoshaphat means the judgment of God. I'm going to call them together into the valley of the judgment of God. Now, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we read of a battle. Uh, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites gathered together against King Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the Bible says, didn't even need to lift so much as a finger. When the enemies came and gathered, we don't know what the valley is. Kidron Valley, Megiddo, we don't, we're not sure, so I won't say. But it was a valley where God drew these enemies, or they gathered against Israel, against Judah, to destroy Judah under King Jehoshaphat. And God said, do you remember the story, what did God say? It's not your battle. My battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. And God caused the Edomites and the Ammonites and the, uh, uh, and the Russellites and, and the Moabites, all the ites, to turn against one another. And there was utter destruction. Jehoshaphat and his army never had to raise even a single finger. God said, the battle is is mine. And God caused the enemies of his people to turn on each other. This was some 50 years earlier than Joel's prophecy. So Joel now is writing to Judah and he says God is going to call, in the future, God is going to call the nations, the people of the world, into the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's fresh in their minds. They, 50 years removed from this, they, they remember or at least have heard of the valley of this judgment against the people with Jehoshaphat. And so now they're, they're, they're keenly aware of what that means. God totally destroyed the enemy. And so now Judah say, uh, uh, Joel says to Judah, uh, th God is going to call his people, all the people, to a, um, to a, ba to a battle uh, like that of Jehoshaphat. 
God was saying that this future judgment would unfold in the same way as the battle of Jehoshaphat, only on a much larger scale. Are you with me? Amen. The battle was the Lord's, and it would result in utter destruction of his adversaries, just like that of Jehoshaphat. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. Why? The Valley of Megiddo. In the, in this future battle will take place in the Valley of Megiddo. Uh, Har in Hebrew means valley. Megiddo is Megiddo. So Har, Armageddon is simply the Valley of Megiddo. In the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon, Valley of Megiddo. Revelation 16:16, 16, 16, Jesus speaking through John. Uh, and, and John writing, he says, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon, or the Valley of Megiddo. Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So the kings of the earth, their armies, gather to make war against the Lord. Jesus, remember the Bible says he... He comes and he stands on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, we say it cleaves in two. It actually splits in four. To the east and to the west and to the north and to the south. So the, the, the valley, uh, the, 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 the Mount of Olives, gone. And we know that Jesus comes riding in, the Bible says, uh, and all his saints with him. Oh, when the saints come marching in. He who is on the horse in this picture is the Lord. The, of Je this is Jesus. And the Bible says here that uh, in Revelation, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So these people, the, bat, the war, these people in the, in the world will rise up against Christ and they'll come to Megiddo. They'll come to this place to make war against Christ. Judgment of Judah's enemies. G, uh, Joel explains this when he says on that great and terrible day of the Lord. You still with me? Amen. And then he explains why this judgment is coming. And I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And then he goes into explaining they're sold into slavery, into prostitution, and so forth. Listen. The judgment for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. Friends, this is the conquering by the Romans. When they invaded and they, they desecrated, they destroyed uh, Jerusalem and they scattered the people and the Jews have been dispersed all over the world routed out of their land ever since now we know they're there's they're coming back but remember in Joel's day he's talking about how how they had been dispersed over all the land they had been the promised land the land that was theirs taken from them and they were dispersed all over the world the Jews have been dispersed over the world ever since and they parted my land. Are you still with me? Get, can, can you give me 10 more minutes? <laughs> Thank you. I'll take 50. I hear 20. <laughs> Why is this judgment coming to the nations? Because they have dispersed my people. They've driven them from the land. And they have parted my land. How many times has the tiny little land of Israel, they call it Palestine, uh, how, uh, that land of Canaan, how many times has it been uh, uh, pieced out, and, uh, broken apart? How many people have owned it, claimed uh, rulership over it? Uh, it's been divided, it's been parsed out. Um, and uh, how many times, all through the years, sometimes land being given or taken for the sake of peace? It will never. It has never, and it will never happen. Given land for peace is a, is a fallacy. It will never happen. And now the whole two-state solution that we hear about, the United Nations, and we hear it played about with, um, you know, they're, they're always talking about a two-state solution. Two-state solution is taking the land and dividing it so that 
Palestine will be a state of their own. There'll be a country with a capital, the capital being East Jerusalem, and the Jews, uh, Israel, will have their own land and their own state and their own capital, West Jerusalem, and, uh, and there will be peace, finally. Friends, that will never, ever happen. It has never happened, it never will. If you think there will ever be peace because they've parted the land, you have missed history. And if it should happen, and it very well may happen, this will only further the wrath of God. Because they have parted my land. And how many times has this happened? And then he goes into slavery and prostitution of God's people as repeated through the centuries. The Romans sold Jews into slavery, uh, raped and pillaged the women and children. The Russians, the Germans, the Polish. You look at history, how many times the Jews and, and what, what, what terrible atrocities have been done to Jews simply because they are Jews. God will judge the nations of the world for their treatment of his people from the beginning to that time. And it says here, I'm almost done. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. We need to see what this truly means, friends. Because it doesn't mean what it looks at face value. A multitude, a concourse of people, including the idea of noise and tumult according to the Old Testament word studies. Were you here this morning when, before we began to sing? What did Alan say? Everybody's talking today, everybody's chatty today. What did you hear? When you, when, if you just stood back, what did you hear? You heard church, Bible, today, Monday. You heard, you heard noise, but you, but you didn't hear any words. If you did, it was just one here and there, but it was, we call it the din of the crowd. Have you ever been in a large arena, in a sports arena, when there are tens of thousands of people and everybody is shouting? That's all you hear. You hear the din. It, it becomes a hum. It's a loud noise, but you can't distinguish the voices. That's what this word multitude in Hebrew means. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Large groups of people making a lot of noise. Imagine millions upon millions of people challenging the God of creation. Coming from all points of the world to Megiddo to challenge Christ. Could you imagine? The anger of the nation, of the armies coming together to battle God. Listen to what the psalmist said. Psalm chapter 2 is prophetic of this day. Psalm chapter 2, the writer says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Certainly is a vain thing if you're going to challenge God. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. He that sitteth in the heavens will laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Derision means mockery. The Lord will mock them at that time. And God sitting in the heavens will laugh. Please hear me, and I'm almost done. You say, that sounds cruel. That sounds like God is evil. That he would laugh at the people before he's about to destroy him them and that he would mock them chance after chance after chance after chance God has given he sent the prophets to warn them to warn the world 
of, his, of who he is and his great love for people and how he wants to redeem them and keep them. He wants them to come and love him. He just wants to love the world. They want, he wants them to see who he is. And the prophets came and warned them about their rebellious ways. And they, they stoned the prophets. Don't want to hear what you say? Die. He sent the law to say, okay, this is what I require of you. Keep this law. Obey me. They perverted the law. Rejected it. So he sent his only son. God in the flesh. Emmanuel. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. The, the incarnation, God himself, the, the Lord of glory, the eternal, absolute, almighty God, limits himself. He comes down into the, into the lowest form, into, into a, a, a pauper's life, not even a king. He comes down to be into the, born into the family of, of poor people, humble him himself to the, the very lowest, to be one of us. And there to be, to, to represent us before God and to live perfectly and then to die for our sin, to take our punishment, to restore us into fellowship with the God that we have rejected. And what do we do with the Son of God who came to express God's love? Crucified him. We will not have this man to rule over us. Time and time and time again, generation after generation, century after century, Choice and chance and mercy and grace. And through it all, we have said no. And now, when that day has fully come, in that day, in those days, and in that time, friends, God has done all that he can. Can't you see the arrogant rebellion defying the God of creation at every turn? Can't you see it? Ten Commandments, we won't have it. Uh, a nativity scene, not on my corner. Jesus, don't mention him. God's love doesn't exist. Time and time again, rejecting everything that's godly, everything that's pure, everything that's holy, we don't want to know any of it. God says, I've done my absolute all for you. After all his mercy and all his grace, there will be the multitudes who will reject him and his salvation. And God says, and they will come. The, he, the Bible says that he will gather them, but it also says that they will come to the valley of Megiddo to challenge God. We won't have you. We're going to knock you off your throne. We're going to overpower and we're going to take charge. The heathen imagine a vain thing. And in that day, God will laugh. And hold them in derision. Multitudes. Multitudes in the valley of decision. The word decide, friends. Give me a minute. I still, I'm still working off the last ten minutes. So I think i got two left. The word decide. Do you know what, the, what it means? Decide. Decision. Have you ever looked it up? The definition. Decide in its root meaning means to cut away. It means to decide. When you make a decision, what you're doing in essence is you are cutting away all options. You say, I've got this option, I could do this, I could do that, but I have decided. I have cut away all other options and you have made a decision. That's what the, mean, what the word means. We decide when we cut off all options. In this context, it is the valley of cutting off. What it will mean then is that God will have cut off all those who have withstood him. Friends, the valley of decision does not mean that they will have a chance to decide. Hear me? It doesn't mean that they've been called to the valley to make a decision. It means that they have already made their decision and now it's God's decision. And God then says he is cutting them off, all of them, all those who have opposed him, all those who have rejected him. And he's judging the nations from what they have done down through the ages against his people. The time of decision for God, for us to choose God, is now. 
So for us today, we are in, the multitudes are in the valley of decision. If you're going to decide for Christ, if you're going to decide for God, now is the time. Because when that day comes, the trump of God sounds, the dead rise first, the church is caught up, it's over. And the chance for... for though, now let me say, just quickly, though, there will be those who are saved during the tribulation period. I believe those are those who have not heard the word of God, who have not had the opportunity to accept or reject. And now, they're make, when they hear, they will make a decision for Christ. But those who have heard...